So this morning I'd like to talk to you about why the Jews rejected Jesus. Uh, I subtitled this, Misunderstanding uh, the Messiah as Written in Prophecy. <clears throat> in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 12, this is the New King James Version, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And so we, as Christians, we see that verse, and we know that the Jews rejected him, but we have accepted him. Well, let's look at the Messiah of Scripture as we understand it. We understand the Old Testament prophecies to say that the Messiah would come, that he would die for the sins of the people, that he would be rejected by them. That uh, Some of you may not be familiar with this prophecy, but the Old Testament prophesies that even that Jesus would come before the Second Temple was destroyed, that Messiah would come before the Second Temple was destroyed, uh, that he would have a priestly ministry so that he would not just be a king but also a priest, and that he would be the Son of God, and that the message would then go to the Gentiles. Well, the, the, the title of this lesson is uh, Why the Jews Rejected Jesus, but that's not exactly an appropriate title completely because not all the Jews did reject Jesus. And so let's remember that. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter gave, gave the first gospel sermon, there were 3,000 who responded to the message. And so not all Jews rejected the message of the Messiah. And in contrast, most current Jews follow what they call Talmud interpretations of the scriptures, and I'll explain what that is in just a moment. It's similar in, in Christianity to somebody following just the writings of Calvin and Calvin's interpretation of, of the New Testament, you see, or somebody following Luther's interpretation of the New Testament, or somebody following Homer Haley's interpretation of the New Testament, you see, rather than going directly. So well, the reason I throw in Homer Haley, because we could be guilty of the same thing if we're not careful. But what the, what the Jews do is they follow interpretations of the old law, um, mainly that have developed over, over the years since, uh, in a matter of fact, since Christ's death. And some Jews do actually believe in Jesus. You've heard of Jews for Jesus. Now, there are some Jews who keep the old traditions and then accept Christ as the Messiah. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with the Old Testament uh, Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament is actually a better name for it would be the Hebrew Bible. In fact, if you think about how much of the Old Testament actually, what the word means is Old uh, Testament or the Old Covenant. Well, how much of the Old Testament that we call the Old Testament is really about the covenant? Well, you know, the, the books of Moses outline the covenant. And actually, Genesis outlines a lot of stuff before the covenant actually happens. But, you know, the covenant started at Mount Sinai. And so there's a lot more in what we call the Old Testament than just the covenant itself. And so I think a better name of it is just to call it the Hebrew Bible. In fact, what we call the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible, and it's made up of several components. One is called the Tanakh, and this is the Jewish canon. Every Jewish text that they consider to be inspired, they put that in what they call the Tanakh. You may have heard the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew. When we get our, when we get our Old Testament, they largely take texts like the Masoretic text, the authoritative Hebrew text, and we get our Old Testament from that. Now, it's a slightly different order. The way we arrange our Old Testament is different than the Hebrews. Like, for instance, we have First and Second Chronicles. They just have Chronicles. It's all together. My point is, is when we would call the Old Testament, they would call the Tanakh or their Hebrew Scriptures. But the Tanakh is divided into three sections. One is the Law of Moses. They call that Torah. And you may have heard this before, this being used. That Torah actually means, in Hebrew, instruction or teaching. And that is what we would call the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They call that Torah. Now they also have prophets' writings, and we know the writings of the prophets. They group all those together. They call that the Nevim. But in, other than just what we would consider prophets, they also include the books of Joshua through Kings in their book of Nevim. And then you have Ketuvim, and this means writings. And so you have Torah, which means instruction, Nevim, which means literally prophets, and Kedavim, writings. And that includes everything in, our, in what we consider our Old Testament, doesn't it? The instructions, uh, the Old Covenant of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and then the other writings, like the Chronicles. They also include books like Ezra or Nehemiah. These are historical books that tell narratives and the writings. Uh, you think about um, other books that aren't, wouldn't be considered to be uh, prophet writings would be included in there. So what is the Talmud, then, if that's what they're 
uh, going by today in, in interpreting the Bible. Well, just to give you some history, we know that the temple, the second temple, was destroyed in AD 70. The Romans came in and destroyed the, the temple, and there's no more temple in Jerusalem. Actually, there's a Muslim uh, temple there now. Well, the temple was the center of worship and Jewish scholarship there. And it, when that was gone, it was destroyed. And up to that point, Jews had the law, the written uh, Hebrew Bible, and then they had oral traditions, ways of interpreting it. Well, they were afraid that their oral traditions would be threatened, and so they wrote them down after the temple was destroyed. Now, we believe um, that there's, there's debate among Christians, but some Christians believe that all the scripture was written before, all of our New Testament scripture was written before AD 70. Some people at least agree that it was written before the year 100 AD. But they started writing their oral traditions down after the temple was destroyed, okay? So what most Jews follow today is not actually, is, is an is a interpretation or commentary on the scriptures written after our scriptures were, our New Testament scriptures were developed. I just kind of want to make that point. So what they did is they compiled all these different oral traditions and they had different, they, they consulted them and wrote them down and they edited them and compiled a book called the Talmud and that was largely led by a rabbi Judah uh, Hanasi in the year 200 AD. And so that was when it was first published. The, what, and what all Jews now commonly go by is they have the Hebrew Bible, but how they interpret the Hebrew Bible is by this Talmud, the, uh, which was first published in 200 AD. And this continued to be developed, um, and there's two major schools. There's one developed in the land of Israel. There's one developed in Babylon when Jews were being persecuted from the Romans. Most of them follow the Babylonian Talmud. The oldest known manuscript we have is from 1530 A.D., the oldest existing. And here would be a section of the Talmud. Um, the center portion would be uh, what they call the Mishnah. Now, when they were, that, that Mishnah means repetition. So this was the oral tradition they would pass down from generation to generation. It would be like, Rich, repeat after me as you're a child. And, I'm, and you're repeating this stuff and you're remembering it. You're remembering it from generation to generation like stories. Uh, Many stories were told like this, uh, Aesop's fables and other things, right? That's, it was an ancient way of remembering stuff. Well, this, this tradition that they wanted to capture, that they were afraid would be lost, would be all their oral tradition from the time they came back from Babylon in about 536 B.C. and rebuilt the temple from the time of, to the time of A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. So they were trying to capture all this oral tradition in the Talmud, and that's what they did in this center section here, which they call the Mishnah, and that's written in Hebrew. <coughs> that was first published in 220 A.D. Now, from the time that that was first published, they also, ever, ever since then, they've had what they call the Gemara, which means the study or learning by tradition. And from 350 to 500 A.D., they had a lot of other rabbis who would look at the, the oral tradition that was written down, and they would make commentary on this. So the Mishnah is commentary on the Bible, and the Gemara is commentary on the commentary. You see that? And so it circles this. <coughs> most copies, that, most of the popular copies that the Jews followers today would, of the Talmud would also include the commentary of a, a well-respected rabbi named Rashi who lived around 1100 A.D. And so then you have a commentary on the commentary on the commentary. And that's what you're, you're, you're dealing with here. Uh, commentary about commentary about commentary about scripture. And this is not that unlike what a lot of uh, Christian churches practice when they're going by church traditions, you see, or the Catholic Church when it interprets stuff over time, over time, over time. They're looking back at writings and maybe revisions on them. So this is, what I'm saying is, this is not just a, a, a problem that, uh, uh, this is not a pit that just Jews fall into. Christians also can fall into this pit is what I'm saying. So let's not be too, <laughs> too hard on them. Well, in Mark 7, this is what Jesus is warning about. Mark 7, he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honor me, with their, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. See, these oral traditions were well, they were well known and well in place by the time Jesus walked the earth. These, the Mishnah, that center portion, what was trying to be captured uh, on paper, was what Jesus was dealing with in his society, you see. Uh, and what he says is, verse 8, For laying aside commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. Those are things that would have been captured in the Mishnah. 
In verse 9, he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. And so that's the danger there. <clears throat> so what are the contents of the Talmud? Well, the, the, the Talmud reflects the Jewish collective thought as of 200 AD, you see. And so it suffers from some revisionist history. Uh, the, there was 3,000 Jews that accepted what revisionist history means, you wait some time later, you look backwards, and then you only report the history that you want to report. Okay, that's what, you, you revise the history. And, it's, and, and I was shocked when I learned this, because I just thought, I, I didn't realize that the Talmud was published even after our New Testament scriptures. But what they do is they do not reflect the arguments from those Jews who accepted Christ. See, there was 3,000 that accepted him on Pentecost. You know, there were even rabbis who were converted. We read about that in the, in, in the book of Acts. But none of those people's arguments for why he is the Messiah was recorded, you see. Only the things that are why he's not. And it actually condemns Christ. You'd think if, if Christ was just a kind of a, a passing thing in, in the history of Judaism and he wasn't really a big deal, you'd think the Talmud wouldn't even really mention him that much. You'd be like, remember what uh, Gamaliel said. You know, there's been other people who came and it was never a big deal. We could be fighting against God. You'd think if it wasn't a big deal, then it wouldn't even really show up in their religious scriptures that much. But there's surprisingly a lot of the Talmud that addresses Christ and why you shouldn't believe in him. So it seems like much of the Talmud is developed against Christians and against people accepting him. So it actually condemns Christ to call him a, make many charges, but some of, them, some of these are some of the most common ones, that him being an idolater, a sorcerer, and sexually immoral. Uh, surprising how much attention is given to him. Now, here's an excerpt. I got this from a website. It's, they call themselves Jews and Hasidic Gentiles United to Stop Amalek. You know, they're basically, they're, uh, they're against the Gentiles. They're basically saying that we need to just keep the, keep the scriptures. That, and, and they have many, th there, this is some quotes from the Talmud themselves. The Talmud, which is the, ba this is the Babylonian edition, which is the most commonly, commonly used one among the Jews. And in fact, when you say Talmud among Jews, they, unless you specify, they just assume that you mean the Babylonian one. They record other sins of Jesus, and this is a quote from them. He and his disciples practiced sorcery and black magic, led, Jesus, led Jews astray into idolatry, and were sponsored by foreign Gentile powers for the purpose of subverting Jewish worship. And it gives a scripture, or not a scripture reference, but it gives a Talmud reference there. Sanhedrin 43a. Number two. He was sexually immoral, worshipped statues of stone, a brick is mentioned, was cut off from the Jewish people for his wickedness and refused to repent. Sanhedrin 107b and Sota 47a. So it's given references there. Uh, he learned witchcraft in Egypt and to perform miracles he used uh, procedures that involved cutting his flesh, which is explicitly banned in the Bible. Shabbos 104b. So they are, I mean, I was surprised how much they condemn and how wicked it is talking about so blatantly against Jesus like that. Well, what are their reasons for, for rejecting him? <clears throat> well, here are some of the main reasons that I've come across from my research, and it would be very difficult to address all of the, because these, they've been developing rejections of Jesus for 2,000 years, and so in, you know, say 30 minutes, it would be hard for me to cover all of them. But I'm going to touch on some. They have a belief that when the Messiah comes, he will gather all the Jews back to Israel. They believe that. Um, we believe that already happened, and they messed it up but when they came back from Babylon, but we'll go into that. They believe that the temple has not been rebuilt, and that when Messiah comes, the temple will be rebuilt. They believe that all Jews must keep the law for Messiah to come. And since, and since Jesus did a, you know, said, don't keep the law, and they went to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles aren't keeping the law, then that can't be the Messiah. They say that when the Messiah comes, all nations will know the one true God, and since that is not true, uh, today, then, then they, they don't feel that that's accurate. Well, they say that Messiah is from Judah, a son of David, and that, that since Christ was born to a virgin, he can't be the son of David. That, he, that Messiah is not a priest, and Messiah is not God. They don't expect Messiah to be a priest or to be God. They just think he's going to be an earthly king, a man. And the last one is they think Jesus used magic as his proof, whereas Moses didn't need magic. And so here's a list of things, and the reason I'm going over this is um, we don't come in contact with too many Jews, but I think it's important for us to realize why the Jews, to be familiar with these arguments against Christianity, you see, and so that we'll be more firm in our own faith. Well, here's one that they, they look for about Messiah will gather all the people back to Israel. 
and they refer to the blessings and cursings that, that, Jesus, that, that Moses gave at the end of Deuteronomy. Remember, Moses said, if you, have, if you follow what I say, or God said this, if you follow what I say, you'll have blessings, and if you don't do what I say, you're going to have cursings. But if you repent, I will gather you back up. And so they look at this, especially verse 3, where it says, they'll, when you repent, you know, he'll gather him again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. So they're, they're, looking, they're reading this many years past, looking back at Deuteronomy, thinking that if they repent again, then God will give them another shot. Where, in fact, God gave them many, many chances to do it. And when he sent them off to Babylon, what did they do? They repented, and God did bring them back. So this has already been fulfilled, but they're looking for a renewal of that old covenant at Sinai. And God finally, remember, he cut him off and said, I'm not going to, to accept you anymore. I was going to bring the new covenant, which would go to the Gentiles as well. Well, like I said, we already understand this to have, have happened. They look at Jeremiah 33, 30 and verse 3, where it says, Behold, for the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Well, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, where is he writing from? He's writing from uh, Jerusalem. He's writing from Jerusalem among the people who were left behind there. And that he's writing in the future to a time where the Babylonians, who are, who, who the Jews who are in Babylonia, will come back to the land. So this was written from a, to a future perspective when, the, when they would be released from captivity to come back. Does that make sense? But the Jews are looking at this now 2,000 years later, or even during the time of Christ, and saying, we're expecting another shot. Just give me one more chance, you know, that he's going to bring them back again, and that's certainly not so. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 37, and these are scriptures that they use, uh, and I'm just responding to them. Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in my great wrath. I will bring them back to this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. Well, again, that was fulfilled when the decree of Cyrus came out in 536 B.C., and the Jews did, they did come back, and they did rebuild the temple. The Jews argue that this is still yet to come. They also look at Ezekiel 11, verse 17, where it says, Therefore, says, uh, Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assembly from the countries where you've been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And verse 36, 24, For I will take, from, I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. See, Ezekiel and Jeremiah are saying very similar things. But where is Ezekiel prophesying from? He's, he's by the river Kibar in Chaldea in Babylon prophesying. Jeremiah was back in Jerusalem among those who remained, but they're both prophesying roughly at the same time, saying <laughs> roughly the same thing, that this captivity is going to be over one day. Well, the Jews are, the Jews are looking at this much later, going, looking back at it. They don't see that that ever happened, and they're waiting for it to happen again. One of the reasons that God sent uh, Ezekiel to the captives in Babylon was to provide them a message of hope. And most of the people who study that book realize that one of his main purposes of prophet was to give the people in captivity a message of hope that they would one day return to the land. And they did. But the Jews don't believe that it's happened. They also believe that there's going to be a new temple rebuilt for God. And they'll look at Ezekiel 37, 26 through 27. And it says, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. And so they're looking for that temple to be a temple to be rebuilt, one that will never be broken down. They look in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount and see a Muslim mosque there, and they're waiting for that to be wiped down and the temple to be rebuilt. Well, verse 27 says, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my, my people. Well, look what Jesus says about that. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our home with him, or our abode with him. And so, the New Testament, there's not a physical tabernacle. We under, a Christians understand there's not a physical tabernacle that lasts forever, but God dwelling with his people uh, being forever, you see. Um, but they're expecting it to be rebuilt physically in Jerusalem. It was physically rebuilt in Jerusalem after Babylon, in 530, you know, in 536 B.C., when Cyrus let them go, um, the Jews came back. They, they built the temple after some time, and then it lasted and got, kept getting renovated and renovated and lasted up until 70 A.D. But they don't, they're waiting for another, another shot, you see, which has already happened. So there was complete fulfillment of that. 
They're also waiting for complete world peace. They say the Jews, uh, they weren't in peace during the Roman times because they were under Roman rule. And they, weren't, they, they haven't been in peace since then. They've always been persecuted. And so what they're doing is they're saying, well, this covenant that God is supposed to, he's supposed to make a covenant of peace with us, but we haven't experienced peace. We have a war with everybody. And so they're not understanding that the covenant of peace is peace between God and man rather than peace between man and man. They also look at this. Uh, well, no, they don't look at this, but this is something that we understand is that the Messiah would come during the time of the second temple. And he would be cut off. And Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, which some of you might be familiar with, some of you may not, we're going to be studying this eventually when we get to the book of Daniel. It says this in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, who made that? Cyrus did. He said, and that was in 530, around 536 B.C. From, there's some time markers given here. He says, from that time until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. There shall be again, and we don't know exactly what, you know, those, some people say those are weeks of years. It's about 490 years. There's different math done on that. But here's what we do know. It says, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off. So regardless of the time, there's going to be, uh, the temple's going to be built. temple's going to continue to be built. At the end of 62 weeks, the Messiah's going to be cut off. And the, print, the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So you have the Messiah coming, and then you have the temple being destroyed, you see. Well, when did the temple get destroyed? Well, the temple got destroyed in 70 A.D. So according to this, Christians understand that the Messiah came before that. Uh, I know you're getting some kind of confused looks. But this is a prophecy that Christians understand as meaning that Messiah would come and the temple would be destroyed. And so... They're looking for a future fulfillment of this, which has already happened. They're also looking for worldwide peace, as I said. And they quote scriptures like Isaiah 60 and verse 18, which says, Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. We don't, Christians don't see any, any conflict with that because we're looking for uh, something that can't be taken away. The walls of the spiritual church, in essence, the boundaries of that are the, all those who have salvation, you see. And so that's the walls of what we understand to be the spiritual body or the spiritual Jerusalem or the new Israel. When they look at Isaiah 60 and 19, verses 21, uh, although they take the literal uh, violence to be taken away, they don't see the literal sun to be taken away. And that's, that's why I want to be, if you're going to read a passage, you need to be consistent. If you're going to say that's, there's going to be no physical violence, then you'd have to go here in verse 19 and say, well, the sun would literally be taken away as well. And that's not true. Because it says there should be no longer, uh, the sun should be no longer your light. We understand that in a spiritual sense to be that Jesus is going to be our light. You see, um, and, and Christians already believe that to be fulfilled. Well, they also believe that all Jews will keep the law. And that's largely according to Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10, about the blessings and the cursings, that when, when the, the Lord is going to gather them all up and bring them back to the land that, that, they, that their fathers were promised, and all the people are going to return back to the law. Um, notice in verse 10, the conditional statement is, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law. And so it just doesn't comprehend to a Jew how um, they can receive the Messiah without keeping the old law because they're looking at it through the lens of the Mosaic promise here that redemption comes through keeping the law. And so when they see Jesus and, and his disciples teaching them not to keep the law, it just doesn't compute. You see that. Well, <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33 is a, is a quotation that both Christians and Jews look to. And I'll explain why. Jeremiah 31, 31 is the most fundamental passage in the Old Testament that we use as proof for the New Covenant because it says that there will be a New Covenant made. There's not a lot of passages in the Old Testament that say this. This is the fundamental passage, and both Jews and Christians look at this as a proof text, if you will. Now, Jews look at it this way. 
Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant, that I will make the house of Make the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the Jew looks at it like this. We're going to get a renewal of the, of the covenant of Mount Sinai. But the difference is, instead of it being written on tablets of stone, it's going to be written in our heart. But it's going to be the same law. See, they, they want to, it's the same Mosaic law to the Jew. It's just going to be on their hearts now. As Christians, we look at this, and we understand that to mean a different covenant, not like the one at Sinai, but a new kind of spiritual covenant that's going to be made. And so they, don't, they reject that uh, new covenant. So when Jesus came and was offering a new way of salvation, both to Jews and Gentiles, that's not what they were thinking in their head. They were thinking, we're waiting on a, a renewal of the old deal. We got a pretty good deal. We got lands. We had milk and honey. We had physical blessings, physical prosperity. We had an earthly king that beat up, you know, beat up all the nations around us when we were doing right. And they, in the Jews' mind, if we can just get our act together and get all the Jews to keep the law, then everything will be okay, and we'll get a we'll get a renewal of that old deal. Whereas Jesus was bringing the final judgment on the old deal and introducing a new spiritual covenant. Uh, if there's any confusion about this, you can ask me later because I I don't want to confuse anybody. Uh, another, another question that they uh, pose and the scripture they use is Ezekiel 11 verse 19 to 20 then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God and so they're looking for that Old Testament covenant renewal but God's going to change their heart so they can keep the Old Testament laws you see that? That's what they're looking for, the Old Testament laws. Um, and I should say they were expecting God to help them better keep the law of Moses is a good way of uh, saying that. <coughs> well, another, another uh, one that they say is that all people have knowledge of God. And they use Ezekiel 38, 23, where it says, Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. And the Jews looked around and they said, Well, that hasn't happened yet. No, not everybody's bowing down to God, so the Messiah hasn't come. Well, another one they use is Psalm 86, 9, where it says, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. But if you look at the track record here, um, there's 2.2 billion people on earth that claim Christ. Now, we may not all recognize them as having it right or following Christ right, but there's 2.2 billion people that believe in Christ and believe in the God of Israel. There's 18 million people on earth who, who claim to be Jews. And I would ask, who's done a better job at actually bringing people to recognize the God of Israel? Well, Christ has, you know, regardless of what the, if these people are actually following everything Christ said, 2.2 billion compared to 18 million, who are, are they, I mean... Who are they waiting for? I mean, it seems like progressive and progressively there's more and more people who actually at least know about Christ and the God of Israel rather than uh, the, the Jews who haven't uh, spread that word. And then another one they say is Messiah's bloodline. And they'll say the Messiah must be, part, be a part of Judah, that he must be a descendant of, the king, of king David. And, and if you remember, King David was from the tribe of Judah. And they will argue that Jesus can't be a son of David and born to a virgin because they strictly follow the bloodline through the Father, you see. But the reason they point that out is they're trying to catch us in something because they don't even believe in a virgin birth. They're saying if the virgin birth is true, then he can't be the son of David. Well, who, you know, if a Messiah came today, Say, say the Jewish Messiah came. How would they verify that he was from the tribe of Judah? Would they be able to do that? So the, 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 the self-defeating argument is that Jesus' recorded ancestry in the Gospels is better than any ancestry that somebody would be able to come up with today, which is, you know, 2,000 years after Christ. 
They don't believe in the virgin birth, despite the fact of these prophecy, the prophecy in Isaiah 7:14, which says, "Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall name and shall, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us." They don't believe that that. Uh, they probably believe in near-term fulfillment of that back in Isaiah, but not a, a messianic fulfillment of that. But that quote was quoted uh, in Matthew 1:23 at the birth, right before the birth of Jesus. It says, "Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son." And, you sh and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And so that we know in the New Testament scriptures that that's a fulfillment of these things. The other thing <coughs> is the Messiah as priest. We know Jesus to be a, a priest and a king. They, they look at the Old Testament scriptures and they say, I don't see it. I don't see where Messiah was ever supposed to be a priest. Messiahs are from the tribe of Judah through David. Priests are from the tribe of Levi. How can you have the Messiah be both? You see this? It's a good question. Messiah can't be both king and priest. That gets them stuck. And just as a quick history lesson here, you remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the, of the faith. Jacob had all those sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel. One of the sons was Judah. And on uh, the death, Jacob's deathbed, remember there was a promise that the scepter shall not leave the hand of Judah until Shiloh comes, which means peace. And so that was a, prof a prophecy of the Messiah, that it would come through Judah. Well, King David came through Judah, and all the kings came through Judah, and they're waiting for the Messiah to come through uh, Judah. On the other hand, in Deuteronomy 21.5, according to the law of Moses, all the Levites were the ones who were supposed to be priests and not, nobody else. So the problem is, when you have a Messiah who's both king and priest, phew, blows their mind, you see. But there's the problem passage that says the Messiah is going to be a priest. Let's look at Psalm 110, 1 through 4, which is accepted by the Jews as being a, mess a messianic passage. So there's not, that's not in debate. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. Here's the kicker. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, they, they trouble over this passage. They don't know exactly what that means. But Psalm 110 is known to be talking about David addressing a coming Messiah. And the God says the Messiah will be a priest. But he's not a Levite priest. He's like the one of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, remember Abraham encountered this before the law ever came into existence. And, and Hebrews uh, verse 7 uses this as an argument for why the law must change. The law has to change. Remember the, I said earlier, the Jews are waiting for the renewal of the old law, a new deal. For, you know, basically, give me a re-up on that. It's like taking a, I don't know, like a McDonald's coupon from 1950 and say, hey, I want a burger for five cents. You know, the deal is over. It's long over. And, and what's happening when the Messiah comes, he's going to be a priest and a king. The priest and king can't be from... Uh, the, 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 you can't, it doesn't work under the old law. So we've got to have a new law. And that's what Hebrews 7 is saying. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. For of whom uh, these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. The other tribe he's talking about is Judah. There was no, no mention of Judah officiating at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, and it is yet far more evident if the likeness of Melchizedek, there rises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So the Hebrew writer is making an appeal, saying this old psalm, Psalm 110, which everybody knows is a messianic psalm, this is the end result. This is, you know, you guys couldn't figure this out. The rabbis couldn't figure this out. It was like a, how does he be both? Well, I have the answer. There's going to be a new law, a new covenant. And that's the answer. Um, and in verse 18 says, For on the one hand, there's an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitability, unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. <clears throat> Here's another Old Testament reference that the Messiah is also going to be a priest, and that happened in Zechariah 6, 9-13. And what happened here is Zechariah is a prophet 
And the word of the Lord is going to come to him and tell him, this is after they come back from Babylon and there's gifts being brought back. He's going to say, take some of these gold gifts from Babylon and I want you to make a crown and I want you to put it on the head of a priest named Jesus. Joshua in Hebrew. Okay. But this, is a, this priest that's being crowned is a foreshadowing of Christ. I just want to point that out. So let's read this. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Heldai, Tobijah, Jediah, and who have come from Babylon, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold, make an elaborate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua. That's the Greek word for that is Jesus. The son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, now this is what, this, he, this is what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to crown a priest named Jesus, or Joshua. But the Lord is saying, this is what it means. This is symbolically what this means. Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and that word, the branch, Jews, undoubtedly, they know that means Messiah. A, a branch or a root's going to stem out of the, the tribe of Jesse, you know, come out from Jesse and grow up. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. They know that's going to be the Messiah. So here you have a crowning of a priest named Jesus, and they say this is what it means. It's messianic. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the, bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne, and he shall be a priest on his throne. So here we have a priest on a throne. But they don't understand how Messiah can be a priest. And the council of peace shall be between both of them. So... The idea here is it's, it's, it's in the scriptures. They just they don't understand it in the scriptures, you see. So Messiah is God is, is one of the, probably the, the last thing. I'm, I'm just going to talk on two uh, things here real quickly, and that's their inability to understand the Messiah, coming Messiah as being God, and the inability to understand that the coming Messiah was gonna, is performing miracles. They don't see those two things in scripture. Now, there's a famous uh, rabbi named Moshe that many of them uh, followed. And he lived, I guess, around, I don't know, much later, uh, later than Christ, like maybe 11. I, I, I don't, don't even want to say because I'm not sure. But another name for him is Maomedes. And this is one of his writings. It says, Judaism says that the Messiah will be born of human parents and possess normal physical attributes like other people. He will not be a demigod and will not possess supernatural qualities. In fact, an individual is alive in every generation. I can't believe this. An individual is alive in every generation with the capacity to step into the role of Messiah. That's what they believe. They believe that the reason it hasn't happened is because the Jews aren't following the law. But if they ever get their act together and follow the law, that it's, they, they have this notion that it's up to themselves to save them. You see that? That salvation is coming from themselves. That if we do what's right, then God will... Uh, bring the Messiah. And there's one, there's one lying in secret in every generation re re ready to pop out and lead us. And they'll use verses like this, Numbers 23, 19, where it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. And they'll say, if you say Jesus being a man and God, then that's blasphemy. Because Numbers 23 says, God is not a man. Well, you see, I think they're taking that out of context. Numbers 23 is, we, we don't argue that God is not a man. The nature of God is eternal. We say all, that God, that Jesus had both God characteristics and human characteristics. They look at 1 Samuel 15, 27, which says, when Samuel turned and, and Saul seized the edge of his cloak and tore it because he took the kingdom away from him, he says, God is not a man that he should relent. That's what Samuel tells Saul. And so they use those passages, and I think they squeeze them out of context. And, and, and as a result, they have this notion that the Messiah cannot and will not be God, and they won't, they'll refuse to even consider such a notion. And so they believe that if we worship Christ as God, then that is idolatry. But there is manifestations in the scriptures that they can't explain. Abraham spoke to three men that came to him as messengers right before they destroyed Sodom. Two of those men were angels and went on to Sodom, and the other one he addresses as the Lord. And the scripture says he was talking to the Lord in the form of a man. They can't explain that one. Moses sees God on the mountain with the elders in Exodus 24. He sees the back of God in Exodus 33. Isaiah sees God in a throne scene in Isaiah 6. And so while no man has actually fully seen God, there have been manifestations of God on the earth, you see. 
And they, they admit that, but they have trouble with being the Messiah, uh, God taking on the form of flesh and living on the earth. And there's some more conclusive passages. Psalm 45, 6 and 7, it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, which they undoubtedly say that's messianic. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. And so what you have is a, a king being addressed as God and saying God has anointed God. For a Christian, that, that brings us no trouble because we know that it's, we understand talking about Jesus, God anointing Jesus as king. But they can't make sense of that because they don't believe Messiah can be God. And Isaiah 9.6 is, is, is really conclusive for me where it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. What does that sound like? It sounds like a king. The government, you know, somebody holding up government, that would be a ruler or a king. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. That sounds like God, doesn't it? Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. They know the Messiah is going to be the Prince of Peace, bringing peace. So they can't connect all that together, you see. Uh, one of the things that really is important for a Jew is the oneness of God. And they can't get their head around Jesus being God. I, I, I took this from a website called Judaism Online. There's the website there. It, call, it says the Shema, this is what they call it, is the basis of Jewish belief. And they get it from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And in fact, this is, they write it on the doorpost. This is the first thing they teach children to, to say when they start speaking. And a Jewish person, this is the last thing they utter when they die. They try to utter this. So, when Jesus came in John chapter 10, verse 30, and says, I and my Father are one, that's why they got so upset. Because they think that's blasphemy. They say, they, they were learned from an early age that God is one. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. And here Jesus says, I and my Father are one. That blew their mind. That's why they wanted to stone him, you see. <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll skip over that. Here's another passage from this Moshe. He says, the Jews did not believe in Moses, our teacher, because of the miracles he performed. And I don't think that's true. I think um, what they're doing is they're trying to make a case that Jesus, his magic, doesn't prove anything. They dismiss his miracles and say, well, even if he did perform magic, it doesn't prove anything because Moses didn't have to use magic tricks. But if you remember, God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, and if he didn't listen, he was going to send ten plagues. God used Moses to part the sea. God used Moses, remember, to bring water from the rocks. God used Moses to go up on the mountain and the flaming, the fire, and all that stuff, and to come back down. I mean, God used Moses all these miraculous things. But yet they said... Uh, we didn't believe in Moses because of the miracles he performed. They didn't even believe in Moses after he performed the miracles. They kept rejecting him, remember? But let me keep reading on. Whenever anyone's belief is based on seeing miracles, he has lingering doubts because it's possible the miracles, miracles were performed through magic or sorcery. All the miracles performed by Moses in the desert were because they were of necessity, not a proof of the prophecy. Um, and so what they're basing their belief on is the fact that all the people saw God at Mount Sinai, which is not exactly true. They saw the manifestations of God from afar off, but they begged Moses to go up on the mountain for him because they didn't want to see God or else they would die. And so I, I take uh, issue with their respected rabbi Moshe here. Um, in fact, many of the Jews claim that there's no real evidence for Jesus' miracles, yet in their Talmud, they'll say, they'll even give, give heed to the fact that he did perform magic. In fact, Jesus the Nazarene practiced magic and deceived and led many astray, which is in the Sanhedrin 107b. So both our New Testament and the Talmud say that the Jews believed it, but they don't they seem to want to accept it now. That's what happens over time is it's revisionist history. Over time, people just explain away stuff and say, oh, that never really happened. But even in Matthew 20, 12, 24, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So we have it recorded in our New Testament chapter that, in fact, he was doing things, and the, re and the reaction of the Jews was it was magic, or it was demonic. And then, you know, that's confirmed in their own Sanhedrin that they're saying it was demonic. It was, it was, from, it was from the devil. 
Uh, in John 7, 31, it says that, the, that the, the Jews, they could not deny the miracles. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than this man has done? Remember, we just read that in our Bible class. So some of them believed. They, they were expecting the Messiah to come with some miracles. And they said, when the Messiah comes, he's not going to do more than this, is he? We should believe in him. And in John 11, they tried to shut Jesus down because they didn't want any more people to believe. They said, in fact, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our power. And so it's, they're trying to explain away uh, Jesus and cover him up and cover up and hide it. And in fact, what they use is they use Deuteronomy 13 in order to stone him to death. Uh, which is, says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, so it means there's something that does come and does happen, of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve him. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So what they see in Jesus, they say Jesus came, he performed magic tricks, some of the signs came true, but God was testing us, you see, to see if we would really follow him. And the passage goes on to say, verse 5, that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. And so they put Jesus to death because they will claim that Jesus was having them go after other gods because the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. They didn't understand that the Messiah was going to be God. But did Jesus say to worship other gods? No. When, when Jesus came, he held them to account. He said, you're not even following the law of Moses. You're not doing what you, sh what you should be told. You're hypocrites. You're telling other people to, to do things, and yet you won't even lift the load yourself. He was trying to encourage them to follow God. In verse 20, Matthew 23, verse 31 through 37, Jesus condemns them. He says, Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves, that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Meaning, go ahead, you're going you're gonna to fulfill it. Fill up their guilt by killing me, in essence. Serp, uh, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemna condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you kill and crucify. Some of them you scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of uh, Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And many people think this is the Zechariah that we just read about who talked about the priestly king. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That generation that he was talking to, you see, which I understand that to be when the temple was ultimately destroyed. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a, as a, chick gathers, uh, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The, what is Jesus is saying is, Jews... You don't have a good track record about recognizing prophets. God sends you prophets and you kill them. And I would argue with a Jew, this is a very good point. Throughout their whole Old Testament Hebrew Bible, they continue to persecute and not listen to the prophets. And so what makes them think that they're, they're going to recognize the Messiah when he comes? Because they certainly didn't. And that's what Jesus is saying. You always do this to prophets. Well, what should our attitude toward Jews be? It would be very easy for us to, they killed our Christ. We hate them, you know, and, and have some kind of very much hatred towards the Jews. And the Jews, remember, this is the, this is the conflict in the early church. Gentiles, they thought, oh, those Jews are stupid. They don't get their own scriptures. And we're much more superior intellectually to them. We're not even Jews, and we understand this stuff. And the Jews were like, oh, you're not children of Abraham by birth, and so you're less. And so remember that conflict that Paul writes about in many of his letters? I think it's a real danger for us today. We can look at Jews, people who, who are practicing Judaism, and be arrogant towards them. And, and Paul says in Romans, he says, I say then, have they stumbled or have they missed this so they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Because of them ha this happening, we sit here today and have salvation, you see. And so we should be thankful for that. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So Paul is saying we should, we should really encourage them and try to teach them so that they can understand the things that we understand. 
He goes on to say, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my uh, ministry. But if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will be their acceptance? Uh, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And he goes on to say, For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. He's encouraging all of us not to hate Jews, but to encourage them to come to Christ because together, if the root, when he's talking about the Jews, the root, the ones who originally are supposed to have it, if they are accept Christ, then us being the grafted in branches are going to be even stronger. You see that? Who understands, I mean, I, I'm convinced that if you study with Jews, you'd learn a lot about the Old Testament that we don't understand. And if the Jews stayed with us, they'd learn a lot about the Old Testament that they don't understand. And so together, uh, it'd be much better if we all came together and followed Christ. And I want to close with this. Peter's sermon to the Jews. This is in Acts chapter 3, and then that'll be your message for the day. Uh, Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Peter stands up and addresses the Jews. He says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. They just witnessed a miracle, a man being healed. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. They couldn't deny it. A miracle just happened in front of them. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. They're talking about, he's talking about killing the Christ. <clears throat> but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. And so in their mind, the Christ, the Messiah, was supposed to come and be a king and reign forever. But they, they didn't understand that there was a suffering, a suffering servant, and like Isaiah 53, Psalm 22. And at verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come in the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, whom you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. See, Jews... They never accepted that, that a prophet would come like Moses and give them a law, and they didn't listen to that prophet. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You were sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning away from, uh, in turning, uh, turning away every one of you from your iniquities, and so what they do is they're not very pleased with that sermon. But that was that was the truth that he told them. The Jews don't they didn't have a good track record of, of recognizing Jesus as prophets, and even today many still deny it. And so the question is, do we believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And I hope that understanding more why they disbelieve and some of their misapplications of scriptures might strengthen our own faith. And if we have the opportunity to ever come in contact with a Jewish person and they start bringing up these arguments, we'll at least be familiar with them and, and be ready to be res respond. We won't be caught off guard not knowing what they're thinking. This is con the commonly accepted uh, line of reasoning that they use against Christians. Well, I hope that was helpful. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, come up and ask me. Uh, via email or you can come up after uh, the, the service this morning. If there's anything that we can do for any of the members in way of prayer or public confession of sin or if someone would like to uh, make a confession of Christ, we welcome you at this time. It's our tradition to offer that and extend that. I want to thank Andy for the song service this morning and I pray that all of you have safe travel on your way wherever you're going to be this afternoon and, and uh, may some of us meet again this afternoon at Mike's house for the Holy Spirit study. God bless you and uh, have a great day. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.